So this is a topic that I really enjoy teaching about because um, in a lot of ways I have the most significant background and training in this particular topic, which is uh, really coming out of Taoist and traditional Chinese medicine and uh, what it means to live in alignment with the seasons, um, what I like to say to eat and drink seasonally, and also um, you know, that touches on so many, when we talk about vitality as one of the pillars of the way of tea, um, vitality touches on so many different aspects of a tea life or the way of, the way of tea uh, in terms of the way that we live our lives or our lifestyle. And so tonight um, we'll enjoy three cups of tea together in silence. I always like to start any um, of these classes that way. It gives you an opportunity to kind of drop in and um, just settle in to the moment, uh, kind of maybe leave the rest of the day behind you for an hour or so and uh, enjoy some good tea and um, spend some time together. And then I want to talk about um, specifically what this pillar of vitality means, uh, what it is. And, then I'm gonna get into some specifics in terms of food and herbs and tea uh, specific to this time of year. And I'm thinking I might every two months or so do another class on vitality as it relates to that exact time of the year and talk a bit about the transitions in seasons in terms of yin and yang and the five elements and how that relates uh, ways that we can think about food and think about tea and lifestyle um, to live in a more deeper alignment with nature and with the season, um, to enhance our vitality and sense of well-being. And then I'm gonna go through what I call the six healths, which are six, um, whenever I'm not feeling really well or I'm feeling more susceptible or like my immunity's low or emotionally I'm not feeling really grounded or centered or strong, um, I return back to these six healths and I look at them and they're a really wonderful gauge for, oh, right, it's because my sleep is off or certain aspects of sleep or certain aspects of diet or what have you. So I'm going to go over those six healths and then I'll mention a couple other um, of what I call the 12 vitalities. So, of course, you know, you find a lot in Buddhism in particular like endless lists, you know, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And the, um, unfortunately, I am just as susceptible to lists as other people. Um, but I think these vitalities are ways of checking in with aspects of your life, because if you're tending to all of them, even in a small way, on a daily basis, when you add them all up, that's what creates balance. Uh, so we have this concept of balance or harmony being at, at the um, foundation or the essence of real health, real energy, vitality. And balance is kind of a vague and abstract term, and it means different things for different people. You know, some people only need like five hours of sleep, and they can go run 15 miles no problem. For other people, that's just craziness. So um, really balance, I think, is about is about tending to all these different aspects of life regularly. And if we do that over time, it creates really incredible resilience and less susceptibility to um, ill health or um, falling out of center. So um, again, I'm gonna jump into the details of that. It's springtime, it's the time of rising yang energy, of longer days. Um, you know, in nature, it's the time when all the animals come out and start mating. I suppose as people come out of the pandemic, maybe that will happen as well for humans. It's hard to say. Um, but, uh, it's, again, this is a topic I'm really excited about talking about. So let's have a couple cups or bowls of tea together, uh, in silence. I'm not playing music here because the sound, it affects the sound quality a lot. So maybe you want to listen to music or do, however you like to drink tea on your side. Um, and then we'll get into it. Um, I also want to leave some time for questions. So um, the tea that I'm drinking tonight is a Liu Bao, which is a type of black tea. It's true black tea. It's a fermented tea. 
Um, so it's not the black tea like what most Westerners think of as like Earl Grey or English breakfast tea or something. Um, there's a whole long historical story of why that's incorrect. Um, in short, Europeans, in particular the English, just classified all the tea um, in the early 1800s as black tea or green tea. And it was either lighter teas or darker teas, which is a huge um, historical inaccuracy because, you know, there's technically seven categories of tea and they're all so distinct and nuanced. So to just call it all black tea or green tea is kind of ignorant. Um, and they, the English in particular produced a very bitter black tea because they didn't know how to produce it properly, which is why milk and sugar and honey and that's what European was introduced to as tea. And then that's what most Westerners have learned of, learned is tea. But for really nice tea, for living teas, uh, especially for old growth and aged teas, if you were to add milk or sugar or something to it and you were sitting with a, a Chinese person or a Taiwanese person, who really loves tea, they would think you were absolutely crazy because when you put all those additives in the tea, you blanket or you mask all of the nuance of that particular tea, uh, which is really a shame. So part of it is that some teas, especially red tea or black tea, um, has a bit of bitterness. And so if it's processed really well, there's a sweet note that balances the bitterness. But if it's not processed well, it can be a little bit on the bitter side, especially if you overbrew it. And most Westerners don't like the flavor bitter. So of the five flavors, we are not accustomed to true bitter. You know, we say, well, I eat chocolate. And most of our chocolate is, of course, full of sugar um, or honey or agave or whatever. Um, if you ever have a bitter melon, which you have a lot in Chinese food, um, or like a strongly um, brewed green tea, then you know what the real taste of bitter is. And the bitter flavor is really important in terms of the five flavors in Chinese medicine for clearing heat from the body. And what as Westerners do we suffer from more than any other condition in terms of health? Inflammatory conditions. And so clearing heat from the body is an essential part of a healthy diet. Um, which comes from introducing more bitter foods into the diet. So those can come in the form of bitter greens. Um, we're going to get into some of that when we talk a bit about diet. But in terms of eating, um, ideally, if we're following Taoist cooking, we cook with the five flavors, which uh, are sour, bitter, sweet, um, pungent or acrid, um, and the last is salty. And each meal should have the five flavors in the five colors. Um, and the five colors are white, um, white, black, green, yellow, um, and red. And there's like variants of those colors, but if you include those five flavors and the five colors, that's considered a balanced meal. And then with each season, you add a little bit more of the flavor that is aligned with that season, and that then has physiological influence. So this is kind of the alchemy or the adjustment of diet, as well as the teas we drink with each season to harmonize ourselves with what's going on in nature, which of course we are nature, we came up out of nature. Um, and so we're staying in alignment with the natural cycles of the earth. And there's a beautiful saying, and then I'll stop talking and we'll enjoy a couple of cups of tea, which comes out of the Tao Te Ching. And that saying is, uh, man follows the earth, the earth follows heaven, heaven follows the Tao, and the Tao follows itself. And I really like this idea of what, what do we follow as human beings? Um, do we follow uh, suggestions made by marketing agent at you know marketing companies and ad agencies and instagram um sponsored ads and things or do we follow our impulses which following our impulses and our passions can lead us in all sorts of crazy places um or do we follow something bigger than us which is uh the earth because 
we have the genetic memory of the entire history of the planet. You know, everybody's heard us say we're, we're made of star stuff, right? Um, we, or in, in physics, um, energy is not lost. It only transforms from one form to another. So human beings are made of the same material as the earth and we evolved out of the earth. Um, we developed out of the earth. And so the genetic blueprint is in us to follow the natural cycles of the earth. And there's tremendous, tremendous wisdom in following principles that we derive from observing the natural cycles of the earth. Um, a lot of this wisdom would have been understood in a lot of indigenous cultures, but it's been so, so often replaced with industrial cycles. Even our relationship to time has changed. Um, so, I, I will go into a bit more of that a little later, but the idea is that at a very basic level, the food we eat three times or four times or one time a day, the foods we eat, um, the teas we drink, the types of movement, uh, our relationship to intimacy and sexuality, to sleep, um, things that are just part of everyday life, of the way that we live our lives every day, we can align them with a larger cycle that transcends and um, replaces just following our natural impulses. Um, you know, I say we can eat mangoes in the middle of December in a snowstorm in Manhattan, um, and Br the mangoes might come from Brazil. So in terms of eating seasonally, in terms of eating diet that is local and regional, which aligns you with the natural energies of your region where you live, um, we don't naturally do that because we have access to everything 24 hours a day. Um, so I'll talk about a little bit of that, but I just wanted to kind of introduce some of what uh, we'll be getting into tonight. And I hope you have a kettle ready and some nice tea. And we'll just take a couple of minutes and have some uh, bowls or cups together here. And if you've watched any of the other videos, um, you might notice, I'm not gonna go into it in great depth because we have whole, vi I have whole classes on this concept, but the three bowls concept is to really connect with your body and to let go of anything that is outside of the moment. It's, if you do it in the morning, it is creating a standard of practice where you're cultivating presence as the baseline for your day. So bringing a vivifying force, more consciousness, more presence, more awareness, and more listening to something deeper than the perambulations of the mind or the, the acrobatic monkey mind as it bounces around all day. By starting from a place of centeredness, uh, you bring that energy into the course of a day. So um, my invitation is as you drink some tea, let yourself settle into your body and let the mind settle. Um, and maybe just you appreciate more the tea you're drinking if you're um, not doing other things like watching some guy uh, <laughs> on your screen. Um, so I'm drinking a Liubao, which is a black tea. And this is a tea that's in the seasonal tea club, which um, is going out at the end of this month. Um, I start to drink when I wanna drink darker teas in the warmer months. I drink a lot of Liubao because it actually clears heat from the body. So unlike other aged teas, like aged Shengpur or Shopur, um, which are heating in the body. They're, they, you sweat a little bit, they produce more heat. Liu Bao actually is cooling in the body. Um, and so it was drank a lot in the mines in Malaysia. Um, they found a lot of incredible aged Liu Bao in Malaysia because Chinese immigrants brought it with them in the early 1800s or in the 18, mid 1800s during the tin mining boom. They brought a lot of Liu Bao tea with them because it was cooling and they would drink this tea down in the mines when they worked to stay cool. So when I want a dark tea, but it's hotter out, it's been a very warm day today here, um, I tend to drink Liu Bao. And it's one of the teas that's going out with the tea club at the end of the month. Uh, we're really excited about the teas that we're sending out this month. And if you don't know about the tea club, we go really deep into different aspects of the way of tea. And I curate those teas really carefully. They're really special teas that are appropriate for the season. Um, so obviously the part of what we're talking about tonight is the season and about vitality. So, um, 
Uh, and we have some more Liobao tea that we'll have soon. The one that I have currently at Living Tea is rare and old and quite expensive, but we'll have one that's a very nice tea, but not quite so expensive um, soon. So, okay. Thank you again all for coming. Sorry for the endless rambling. And um, I hope you have some nice tea and we'll take a few minutes to enjoy some cups and then, uh, and then get going.
Okay. Um, I hope you're all enjoying some good tea out there, wherever you are. Um, so this idea of vitality is so essential to a life of tea, to the way of tea, because ultimately what something we say in our tradition is we're not learning how to brew tea. We're learning how to serve tea and the orientation there is there are a lot of people out there in the world who are just into the connoisseurship of tea. They want to know about that, you know, subtle sour flavor in a teguanyin, or it's about connoisseurship, it's about flavor and aroma, it's about how they feel. And a lot of times that lends itself to snobbery. You know, it's about what vintage of teas, and if you're not aware that there, this world exists, like the connoisseurship of like vintage teas and all that. It's a ridiculous world. You can start exploring online. And in a lot of ways, I feel that exploring tea just at that level lends itself to um, relating to tea as an enjoyable beverage, but it doesn't, it's not something that is going to start to affect a person's life. It's not transformative and it doesn't inform other aspects of their life. Whereas if you relate to tea or you start to learn about the way of tea as a practice, as a path, and ultimately as a way of life, I would say at the most esoteric far out level, if you'll go there with me, it's really learning to listen to trees. It is learning to communicate with nature at a subtle level. Um, at that level, tea can really profoundly change a person's life, transform their life for the better. And why vitality is an important aspect of these pillars and something I clarified in the last talk I gave last week about virtue is that these pillars are my own distillation. I've, I'm using them to help me articulate and to share and teach about tea, um, but they are not like capital P pillars. You know, you don't go back to Lu Yu or the classics of tea or the older um, Buddhist or Taoist texts related to tea and find the quote six pillars. So I just want to clarify that so that I can be in integrity with all of you that I'm using these as a tool to teach. <clears throat> They're not drawing out of some specific lineage or tradition. However, all of these aspects of the way of tea you do find in the classic texts on tea. So, um, Quickly, they're moving from the innermost cultivation to the outermost expression of tea. So meditation is an innermost practice. We host meditations every Thursday morning. If you want to learn more about that, come to one of the meditations. Um, the second is the natural expression that arises out of meditation, uh, which is virtue, the cultivation of virtue as a way of life. And I distinguished in this talk last week by saying virtue is not the same thing as morality or ethics or an ethical philosophy. And so if you're curious about that, you can listen to that talk. Uh, virtue, I believe we all have natural human goodness that is at our core in our essential nature. And oftentimes we have layers of identity in the way. So, you know, um, we are looking a lot in the world at more and more levels of control and biosurveillance and order in the world. And that is under the belief, you know, it comes out, it goes all the way back to like Rousseau or Hobbes and Locke, that man's life is nasty and short and brutish. And we would return to a state of nature, which is fundamentally violent and competitive if we were left up to our own accord. I personally do not believe that's true. Um, but the cultivation of virtue is about out of meditation and out of practice, out of self-cultivation, coming back to our original goodness and living from that place. So I believe we are naturally altruistic, caring, kind, respectful, reverential, and ultimately we respect each other's freedom. So the cultivation of virtue is a natural expression and extension of that belief. Um, and then the third, which we're talking about today, is vitality. So in the classic of the traditional classic of Chinese medicine, which is called the Huang Di Nei Jing, uh, some accounts say it was written in like 2700 BC, likelier it was written between 300 and 600 BC. That text um, 
already exhibits an unbelievably sophisticated understanding of medicine and the human body and human health. And it opens up starting by saying, a natural human life should be 120 years old or 120 years. And that if tended to properly, meaning if we cultivate our energy, our chi, we live in alignment with the seasons, we're not living in a constant state of adrenal fatigue and exhaustion and burnt out and run down and overtaxed and underslept and overfed, that naturally extending beyond 120 years is quite normal and natural. And so there are all these accounts throughout the history of uh, Taoist medicine of people living for incredibly long to incredibly long ages. So longevity was a concentration of study for me and when I was in school for Chinese medicine, I'm particularly passionate about longevity. And specific, not, spe not just how do we live to great ages, but how do we live with vi our vital energy intact and supple tendons and joint mobility and healthy spines um, until we're into old age. And you know, there's a, a, a modern Western doctor named Peter Mattia who's done a lot of work around longevity and telomere studies and, you know, cytochrome 450 and different uh, essential amino acids and branch amino acids and intermittent fasting and eating within a time restricted window. All of that is, I think, really wonderful. And I try to incorporate that into my ideas around diet, but I'm also interested in we, a lot of this stuff people were already doing thousands of years ago, and we have historical record of it. So how do we integrate um, those practices into our lives? Now, of course, in observing longevity practices, what we discover, and this is in the Blue Zones, if anybody's familiar with Dan Buhner's work, um, all the practices of longevity also lend themselves to greater human happiness. So they go hand in hand. So how do we live happy lives and also live into great longevity? Uh, the Blue Books, the Blue Book is incredible, or the Blue Zones rather. Dan Buhner's work is extraordinary, um, really wonderful work. And um, this concept of vitality is how do we have enough energy to fulfill our purpose? Because if you're run down and exhausted and you can't think really clearly, then you can't get into alignment with what we call your Ming. And your Ming is your contract with heaven. Um, and if that's too far out for you, then the Ming is your purpose. It's when you're really, when the mind is quiet and you're really in your heart, let's say money was not an issue. There were no external pressures. Um, there were no social pressures. There were no familial pressures. What would you naturally do with your life and your time? Because we have a precious amount of life energy and a precious amount of time on the planet, how are you gonna use that time and do you have the energy to do it? Um, a big part of longevity is, may I have enough time to fulfill my purpose in this incarnation, in this lifetime? So we're really trying to cultivate that energy and that's essential to vitality and that's the main focus of what we're gonna talk about today. And then the, the other three pillars are tradition. So, we have this, you know, this crazy modern idea that tradition is the enemy of progress, which is ridiculous because traditions are not like they didn't just pop up fully formed. Traditions evolved over time. And so in particular, in our lineage, we work with Zen Buddhism and Taoism. And also there's some shamanic practices that we incorporate with tea. And then the, the tradition of nature herself. So observing the principles of nature. The reason that those traditions are really important in our lineage is because those traditions have developed practices, ceremonies, rituals, ways of processing and relating to tea as a way of life. So it's not that they're better than other traditions, spiritual or religious or philosophical traditions. It's just that they have a particular relationship to tea uh, that's been evolved over a long period of time. And we can learn so much from tradition that we wouldn't arrive at just by sitting and drinking tea on our own. So we work with great respect and reverence for these traditions. And then out of those traditions, we have different brewing methodologies. So technically there's nine methods of brewing. We have three that are essential. 
uh, which are leaves in a bowl, side handle, and gong fu cha. Um, and so we teach those. On the website, you can see videos about leaves in a bowl and side handle. And soon I'm going to share a video about uh, brewing gong fu and boiled tea and matcha, whisk tea. Those different brewing methods serve different purpose, purposes, different occasions, etc. Um, and then finally, there's the methodologies of how do you process green tea? How do you process oolong? How do you process red tea? Those are essential to how those teas affect our body, why they're ideal for different seasons, etc. And then the very last of those pillars is community. Um, I love this Tolstoy quote where he says, happiness is only real when shared. Um, we, we, if we don't share tea with other people, in some ways it can be a self-serving or kind of selfish process or self-absorbed um, experience. There's a very significant place for tea, solitary tea but if we've learned anything in the last year during this pandemic, it's that human beings are not meant to be solitary animals. We need each other. We learn from one another. And, you know, the heart is an organ of perception. And when we are starved of human connection, um, it depletes our, our health. It depletes our immunity. It depletes our well-being on every level. I think healthy human relationships are as essential to vitality and to human health as the food we eat and meditation and all these other practices. We have to connect with one another. It's also how we share. It's the source of human happiness is human connection. Um, so again, I just use those pillars to help, help me as tools for sharing. And I think they're also helpful for other people to think about what does it mean to live a life of tea? So this concept of vitality um, can touch on every aspect of our lives and ultimately Vitality is important because the type of tea that we serve to people, so we say we're not learning how to brew tea, we're learning how to serve tea. The type of tea that we are sharing with people is an expression of your own self-cultivation. So are you clear of mind? Are you clear of heart? There's this beautiful term, qing xin, which is a clear heart. Are, are all your relationships straight? Is your chi flowing or is there emotional stagnation and energetic stagnation? Are you eating a healthy diet? Are you moving your body? Are you generally a happy person? Are you clear? Are you emotionally, intellectually, psychologically clear? Are you grounded and centered? If all of these are true, then the type of tea that you are serving and sharing with people will come from this place of clarity. That type of tea you know, there is a transmission that happens through tea when you share it with people. That type of tea can touch people. It can unlock things for people. And then it's really a healing herb. It's a shen tonic. It opens the heart. And it, you know, so many tea sessions that I've been at or that I have served at, people have this cathartic emotional response where they are moved to tears or it's something in their life clarifies or they have eureka or insight, sudden insights. I call them um, micro satori's or miniature satori, little enlightenment moments where they all of a sudden go, whoa, I need to, I need to have this conversation with this person or I need to get out of this relationship or whatever it might be. All of a sudden there's clarity. And that comes because tea is a profound conductor of clarity, clarity of heart, clarity of energy, clarity of mind. Okay, I'm going to slow down brew a cup of tea, I invite you to do the same, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, sp the spring and diet and some specific aspects of this time of year and what it means, what vitality means at this time of year. See, I get excited talking about this topic and then I start floating out of my body. So let's try to stay here and uh, stay connected. So in the springtime, um, we, 
it's all about movement and more specifically expansion. So the element of wood, it's the wood element. So in the Chinese system of the five elements, one way to remember them and to think about them, and I think it's kind of a beautiful poetic description is, think of the wood element as the sprouts rising or leaves coming out of trees. So wood element is like trees growing. In the springtime, everything comes to life. Everything turns green, everything starts sprouting. There's an upward movement and an expansive movement. What we say is the rising yang energy, it's the solar part of the year. The days get longer, so the sun sets later and rises earlier. And the, the warmer weather um, starts to bring the sprouts to life. And that energy of the sprout opening is a symbol of the wood element. So if you think of the wood element as all the plant life and animal life coming out in the spring and growing, the wood, as wood, as trees get old in the forest, they get very dry and brittle. They dry up, which is true for humans as well. The primary contributor to aging as we age is called anhydrosis, which is dehydration at the cellular level. So if you want to remain young and supple and healthy into old age, the first and primary rule is stay hydrated, right? Everybody knows drink water, but I would say this is the first and maybe most important aspect of uh, longevity and of health in general. When you wake up in the morning, drink a giant thing of water. Drink more water than you think you need to drink because you're dehydrated. You know, breakfast is to break the fast. The fast is throughout the night. It's the, throughout the evening, you're not eating. Breaking the fast is why we call it breakfast. The first thing though in the morning, and I don't recommend eating before meditation, your meditations won't be as well because your mind is disturbed because the energy, the chi goes to the digestive system to digest. When you wake up in the morning, try drinking a big, I have like a flower vase, which is huge. And I just sit in my, I stand in my kitchen and I drink a flower vase slowly. And something that is, comes out of the hermetic tradition, um, it became popularized in the wor world with Matsumoto's work on water. Some of you, the hidden messages in water where he like, puts words or he plays classical music and then like death rock and then freezes the water crystals and the ones with classical music or positive uplifting words, those water crystals are beautiful and symmetrical and the ones that have like the word hate written on the, on the side of the bottle become malformed and ugly. The crystals are breaking and falling apart. Water is impregnable, especially at cooler temperatures. So, if you hold a glass of water first thing in the morning and you speak intention into it, the intention should be spoken as a command and in the present tense. So as if it's already happened. So I am healthy or I am um, free of worry or I am free of fear in the present tense as a command or declarative. Um, and then you drink the water, you drink the intention if you do that in the morning and evening, you might notice that things start to shift around that intention. And I always say to people, work with one intention until that starts to shift in their life. Maybe there's a bad habit. So it's, I am free of the desire for sugar or cigarettes or alcohol or whatever. If there's something you're trying to break, a habit you're trying to break. So water, hydrating the body is so essential and fundamental. As trees get old, they dry up as they get older, just as humans, we start to dry up. That's what lends itself to the aging process and wrinkles and all sorts of things. Um, secret, so that's your secret beauty tip of the night is drink a lot of, stay hydrated. Um, as they get old, oftentimes trees will be struck by lightning. They attract lightning, the dryness, or they'll spontaneously combust. If you're walking through an old growth forest, you'll notice these charred trees. So the wood element turns into the fire element. The fire element then turns into ash. The ash falls down, becoming the earth element, becoming the ash turns into the soil. As you go down deeper into the soil, so this is a cycle, down into the soil, um, as you go deeper, you start to find minerals, right? Magma and mineral, trace minerals down in the soil. 
as the minerals go deeper and deeper into the earth and they get hot, minerals, this is a little bit of a stretch, but it'll help you remember it, they turn into liquid. What happens to most minerals at a certain temperature? They liquefy. So we say that turns into the water element. And then the water element in turn starts to nourish the roots. And then we have the wood element rising again. So wood to fire, fire to earth, earth to metal, metal to water, water to wood. And a full explanation of the five elements, we'd be here all night, which some of us probably want to go do other things on a Saturday night. But then you have the cross relationships. So for example, how do you, how do you stop a wood element that's growing too out of control? You cut it down, which is the metal element, the cutting element. If you have fire that's out of control, it's scattering, a wildfire. How do you diminish it or put it out with the water element? So you can think of these elemental relationships um, and how they relate to the human body and how they relate to the seasons. So I'm specifically gonna talk about the springtime, but this is just a little bit to start thinking of elementally, so to speak. Um, so I'm gonna share with you a quote from a wonderful woman, Lori Deshar, who's a practitioner of Chinese medicine and has done a lot of work in Taoist alchemy and putting it in less abstract terms so us, us dum-dums can understand it. Um, she is, uh, she's written a book called The Five Spirits, which is a really beautiful book on if you want to explore those, those five elements. You don't have to be a practitioner of Chinese medicine to understand it, and it's quite profound. Um, so she says, the element of wood, which is related to the springtime, Right now, we're right in the middle of the wood element. The element of wood includes the twigs and branches that quiver in the wind and the leaves that taste of the color green. It's the energy of spring, of new beginnings, progressive movement and reaching towards the future, as well as qualities of fiber and suppleness that give an organism the ability to maintain and dig integrity through the storm winds of growth and transformation. So what she's really talking about is how in the springtime, everything comes to life. Again, expansion and movement are fundamental. So at the level of movement, it's about the suppleness of the tendons and the ligaments and the joints. Getting out and moving the body is essential. As we come out of the winter time, more, more um, active movement is important to move all the stagnant chi that comes from the winter time when the energy starts to drop and consolidate. So in the winter, that dropping consolidating or storage and preservation of chi of energy lends itself well to quiet cultivation. So meditation, whereas in the springtime, there's an outward movement. So, you know, things like Tai Chi, Qigong, martial arts, yoga, but more specifically, all of the classic texts of Taoist medicine say go outside because the, the, the wood element is related to the liver. And the liver, the blood of the liver, nourishes the eyes and our ability to envision and to see things. So getting out, opening the eyes, moving the body, moving the chi, and sweating are encouraged in the springtime, which is not true during the other seasons. We say during the spring, the subtlety and vastness of the universe, the intelligence and intuition of the human being, the ability of the earth to produce, to produce food and to grow, the natural movement of wind, wind starts to come in the spring, and the upward motion of all the plants collectively produce the movement of tendons, the opening of the eyes, the ability to envision, and the emotion of anger if movement is suppressed. So if you don't get out and move the body, there's a tendency for anger to arise. And because we don't really have healthy outlets for anger in the modern world, we tend to suppress the anger and that causes ill health. The suppression of anger blocks the energy of the liver. And the liver is important for the patency and the movement of chi through the whole body. So the blood and the energy that move through the body, that requires a healthy liver. 
So we can't suppress anger. We need to move in the springtime. It's so essential. And this relates to diet and to food. So oftentimes people do a, a cleanse in the springtime, right? They clean out their house. In Japan, there's this beautiful tradition. I forget the word of it. But if you've read, um, what is it? The Magical Art of Tidying Up from Marie Kondo, I think's her name. Um, there's this, which is an incredible book. If, you're, if you haven't read it, it doesn't take a long time. It reorganizes your relationship to things as living things that we should revere and love. And it's about minimalism and simplification. It's a wonderful book. But there's this, uh, there's this practice in Japan of clearing out your entire house, like emptying your entire house and then only bringing back what is it cleaning and then only bringing back what is totally essential. And I'm not suggesting you do that. That would probably take a long time. Um, but metaphoric, it's a good metaphor for clean out the house, like, um, which is also a good opportunity for movement, right? So cleaning out, spring cleansing, clean the mind, clean your space, and specifically clean the liver and the gallbladder. So, um, first I want to talk a little bit just about uh, diet. So there are herbs that are, that are clean, that cleanse the liver and are potent ways to open up the detoxification pathways and to move the lymph, move the blood and to help clean the body out after the winter time. You know, during the winter, we tend to eat more heavy foods, rich foods. So cleaning out the liver also cleans the skin. It, it uh, brightens the eyes. People who have really healthy livers are the ones whose eyes are really bright. You know, like all the white around the eye and the sclera is very clear. Um, and there's a suppleness to the energy. You, you know, you can kind of feel when you're around somebody who's really healthy. There's this, there's like a, I don't know if it's like the, an auric field, but there's a kind of a sense of like, there's something very vital about this person that's intact. Um, a lot of that has to do with your liver being being healthy and clear. We tend to eat so many fatty foods and processed foods. I'm not saying any of you do, but you probably, we all do sometimes. That um, cleansing the body is really essential. And the springtime is such a good time to cleanse the body. So we have herbs like milk thistle for detoxification, uh, peppermint for elevating the mood, and invigoration when we're feeling stuck. Peppermint, what's called bohu in Chinese medicine, you can just drink peppermint tea. Um, moves the energy, it helps you if you feel stuck, and it, it lightens the mood. It's also really nice as an um, essential oil when the mind is sluggish or you feel sluggish. So when I was studying a lot and I was in school, I would inhale peppermint before tests because it kind of wakes you up. Um, Peppermint's also really good for digestive support. And then dandelion, which is called pugamian in Chinese medicine. You know, people have dandelions growing in their yard and they don't realize it's this incredible medicinal herb. Um, but dandelion is really good for cleansing the liver and also for premenstrual cycle. For women who have, you know, PMS symptoms like breast tenderness and achiness and pain during their cycle, can drink dandelion tea safely during that time, as well as megua, which is um, rosebuds. We carry rosebuds at um, Living Tea, but rosebuds and dandelion are really good during that time of, this, of the month, um, and also for digestive discomfort. So, and the last one is an herb called uh, chelidonium, or chelidonium, I think it's pronounced chelidonium, that's a liver tonic for appetite uh, disturbance if your appetite isn't very strong and also for clarity of visional, vision and emo in clearing emotional strain. So if you have a tendency towards anger and frustration and irritability and you, you are irascible, you get angry, angry easily, chelidonium as well as uh, dandelion are very helpful to just soothe the... Um, soothe that tendency towards anger. In the springtime with all this yang rising en energy, there is a tendency towards, if you haven't cultivated stillness and groundedness in the winter months, there's a tendency towards more anger. Um, 
and also towards sexual frustration because all of that ener that yang rising energy lends itself to to sexual frustration or sometimes to an unhealthy relationship to sexuality meaning constant um, overwhelming desire infatuation or lust which is not a healthy balanced way to live to constantly be in a lusting state which can happen in the springtime if you haven't cultivated the groundedness the rootedness in the winter and if you're not moving your body enough to release that energy in the springtime so um i guess we'll move from herbs into teas a little bit and then i'll talk a little bit about food so for a tea person this time of year marks a shift in lifestyle and activity and orientation again it's a movement towards movement and expansion we tend to transition from dark and earthy and grounding teas um, to lighter floral and uplifting teas so instead of shopur and aged shungpur and maybe dark roasted oolongs and the more grounding grounding teas that lend themselves to meditation and stillness in the winter months, we start to move into Chi Man um, red tea, which comes from Anhui. It's a, um, it's a light, a lighter, less oxidized red tea. We start to drink oolongs. We drink younger Shengpur, which is bitter to clear heat from the body and calm that yang energy. Um, we tend to drink, um, high mountain baozhong and denchong oolongs so i start to get into my oolongs and if i want dark teas i start to drink more liobao uh, these black teas the other thing is that our brewing methods tend to shift so instead of drinking a lot of bowl tea and big bowls of dark poor tea i start to brew more um, gong fu cha which is little pots with little cups and the reason we like the little cups is because it's really about the aroma. The aroma of a good oolong is so wonderful, right? And um, instead of those dark teas, that's about drinking the tea and it goes down, the energy moves down into the belly. Those oolongs enter the olfactory senses and they start to open up the crown and the shoulders and they help to open the heart and the lungs. And those mid-aged shengpurs, they're, they're spicy or pungent a little bit. So they open the pores of the body to release heat and to encourage movement. And I like to drink those red teas, like the lighter oxidized red teas, because they're a little more stimulating and they lend themselves to more movement and activity. Um, so getting up early in the morning, meditating, drinking some opening tea and get outside and move the body. Those are, those are after drinking your big glass of water, those are kind of the essentials of the basic vitalities to to starting a day into aligning with the season and getting into brewing more subtle teas with subtle aromas and flavors like oolong teas um you know small zisha pots and small cups have a long history with oolong tea in particular dan chong uh or yen cha cliff tea from fujian um and I'll be talking more and more about these teas, you know, every week as we go through the warmer months of the season. I don't tend to start drinking a lot of green tea and matcha until we get into the summer, but some people like to start drinking green teas at this time of year. Green tea is more bitter. So again, clearing that heat from the body during the really hot months. Okay. Um, another aspect of growth and expansion is creativity. So in the spring, like I was saying, the liver relates to the eyes, seeing clearly, but also envisioning projects. When is a better time of year to start new projects than the springtime? So we have more energy. The, the energy of springtime opens up, like think about and envision what projects can we start? That might be starting a garden or a creative project. Get outside and like paint or whatever it is that evokes a feeling of creativity for you. Work with more interesting chashi, which is tea stages. Um, I did a class on chashi, you can find it on the website. Bring in more creativity and color into the chashi. Um, now, so I wanna move a little bit into food. Um, 
So the flavor of the spring is sour, the sour flavor. What happens when you bite into a lemon or a lime? You, you pucker, right? You pull in, the lips, the lips purse, right? That pulling in of energy is what the sour flavor does. So if you have prolapse of the organs or, you know, um, like diarrhea or things falling, right? Or your energy is sluggish, you know, and you're always kind of like slumped. That pulling in energy is also a pulling up. So it's to conserve, it's to pull in. The other thing about the sour flavor is the sour flavor conserves body fluids. So as, it, as it's getting hotter out and you're sweating more, you wanna conserve body fluids. So what is a perfect way to get more sour flavor into your diet in the spring? A lemon or a lime in your water in the morning. So the lemons are incredibly alkaline, alkalizing. When are you the most acidic, your blood? It's when you wake up first thing in the morning because of this long fast through the night where you're not moving and you're not eating, which is the reason that you can drink coffee or a ver which is very acidic on an empty stomach and it doesn't upset the stomach. Whereas if you drink a young poor tea, which is very alkaline on an empty stomach, you will probably have a stomach ache because you're going from a very acidic state when you wake up in the morning to a very alkaline state. A way to balance that is when you drink that water first thing in the morning, squeeze half a lemon in it. You start to alkalize the body and it also nourishes the body and the sour flavors will help preserve or conserve the body fluids of drinking all that water so you're staying more hydrated throughout the course of the day. If you're more hydrated, you're more energized, you think more clearly. And that's a wonderful way to start to work with the sour flavor associated with the spring. So it's a really simple way to align with the spring energy is drink a lemon in the morning when you wake up. Okay, so spring is a time to eat warm, ascending, mildly sweet foods. And sweet foods harmonize the digestion. Um, so these foods are things like young green sprouting above ground vegetables, as well as leafy greens that support the gentle detoxification, like we talked about detoxing. In the early, in the early spring, I recommend cabbage, sweet potatoes, carrots, and beets. And as the weather changes, we move to mint, you know, sweet rice, shiitake mushrooms, any mushrooms really. Uh, peas, sunflower seeds, pine nuts, and in the late spring, cherries. So these are, again, foods that are, come up in the spring and they help to align us with the spring energy. And also the reason that this fla the flavor of sour is associated with the spring is because it represents the immature fruit on the trees. So the fruit on the trees doesn't mature till later in the later in the spring and sometimes in the summer. In that immature fruit, if you were to bite into it, is a sour flavor. So that green, the green color is associated with sour. Um, so those are sweet, mildly ascending, sweeter foods. Um, and then as the weather or as as we get a little bit further along in the springtime, which is kind of where we are now introducing gently warming pungent foods uh, like fennel, oregano, rosemary, uh, caraway, dill, bay leaf, and then grains, legumes, and seeds. These are foods that we want to integrate as we move through spring. Pungent flavored foods. So when you think pungent, think very aromatic like onion, garlic, ginger, peppers. Um, those foods stimulate the circulation of chi and blood, which you want to do after the winter time because we want to move all that stagnant energy and blood through the body. And it also moves the energy up and out. So as we move further into the spring, we say that the wind of the spring, the movement of the spring can, can affect the liver, causing dizziness, headaches, high blood pressure, um, ringing in the ears right? Tinnitus and also dryness. So we oftentimes people with skin conditions 
will find more dryness in the body in the spring, hence staying hydrated. Um, there are several foods that can reduce the effect of that wind, reduce headaches and reduce the discomfort of spring energy. So some of those foods are like oats, pine nuts, ginger, fennel, basil, uh, celery, mulberry, strawberries, sage, and chamomile. So what I often recommend is making a list of these foods, and I'll tell you where to find a list, and putting that list on your fridge, and then trying to incorporate just a couple of those foods every time you go to the grocery store. Just buy a couple of those foods, and then they'll naturally be incorporated into your cooking. Um, that's something I love to do. Every season, I write out a list of different foods that I want to incorporate during that month or during that season, and then it makes it intuitive and easy when I go shop for them every year. If you want to see kind of a list of what I just mentioned, I pulled that from an article I wrote. It's on the Living Tea blog, and it's called Nourishing Life. And it's a long article about the history of food and what happened with the Industrial Revolution and how, we, how, how food production changed and how we lost connection to a lot of the indigenous thinking about food and diet and why that affects our health. Um, so it's a kind of a long article. It's called Nourishing Life. And if you just want to see the part about food in the spring, you can scroll down in the article and there's a little section called diet and tea in the springtime and that will give you that little list you can print it out uh, put it on your fridge okay um it's important to remember to breathe in the spring as well <laughs> um okay i'm gonna i just want to go through um, a couple of things that I call the six healths. Um, and then I'll add six more that I'm not going to talk about, but I'll mention them. And again, um, I don't want this to be an overwhelming amount of like information. So I won't go, I won't go on too long with it. Um, the first thing I want to just mention because I was talking about food a lot is a couple books that I think everybody might want to consider. Um, so I'm just going to mention these books because they might, if they're, if the topic appeals to you, you might consider getting them. The first one is in the spring and especially as we get into the summer, I introduce a lot more alkaline food into my diet. I eat a lot of raw food, a lot of salads, a lot of, um, fruit, a lot of sprouted grains and sprouted seeds and nuts. And I find that all of that all the enzymes that are intact and all the minerals, the coenzymes, the cofactors in raw food gives me tremendous energy and clarity of mind. So I have a lot of energy through the spring and summertime. Also, eating all those alkaline raw foods helps detoxify the liver, the kidneys, and the metabolic pathways. If you already have digestive issues and you've got really sluggish digestion, you might wanna just steam the foods instead of eat them raw. Um, I feel very lucky in terms of digestion. I could like eat anything and I'm, you know, my body just metabolizes it. Um, but if you have very, um, fragile digestion, then I would recommend steaming the food. It'll make it more easy to digest. But for people who like eating a lot of raw food in the spring and summer a, a friend of mine, uh, Dean Thomas wrote this beautiful book called raw chi and it has different formulas in it to balance, you know, like one on yin and blood. So women nourishing their blood, especially after birth or um, different herbs for different conditions to nourish the blood, nourish the chi and support a raw food diet. Oftentimes raw food is too cooling in the body. It's too cooling in your system. So it's herbs to nourish the blood uh, nourish and warm the digestive system and make it so that you can eat a raw food diet in a healthy way. So if you want to eat more raw foods in the spring, that's a wonderful book. Um, Walter Longo wrote this book, The Longevity Diet. It was published a couple years ago. 
I think he is the world's leading expert at the moment on longevity. Um, and in this book, he, he's done studies that I think were funded by UCLA on for like 25 or 26 years, he's been studying cultures with huge populations of centenarians all over the world. So in Sardinia and uh, in Guatemala and um, I'm totally blanking on the name of this mountain range where these people live, but on these different centenarian populations and trying to understand what are the consistent patterns between those populations. This book is wonderful and the basic takeaway is eating within a window, a time window every day. Um, and for those of you who don't want to read the book, I will share with you quickly the basic idea, which is he recommends a pescatarian diet. We don't need nearly as much protein as people think until over the age of 60. Um, and specifically fish like salmon and small fish like... Um, you know, mackerel and sardines and things because larger fish in the adipose tissue where the fatty tissue in the body is where toxins are held. So like mercury and arsenic and different toxins are held in those fattier fish, which are the big fish, you know, like tuna and swordfish. So smaller fish and especially like salmon. Um, he also recommends, which you can do on a plant-based diet, um, you don't have to eat fish. Um, consuming low but sufficient proteins, minimizing bad fats and sugars, and maximizing good fats and complex carbohydrates. Um, eating a larger variety of food. So those of you who might know about Dr. Zach Bush, um, he's done a lot of work on the gut microbiome and on glyphosate and all that. Um, I was on his podcast, I don't know, two months ago which quick side story, he introduces everybody, there's four of us on the panel, and then says, and Colin Hudon, who has written a New York Times bestselling book on fermentation, uh, wild fermenting, is here to, as our expert on fermentation. And I'm like, I didn't write any books on fermentation. I have no idea what he's talking about. Uh, I was kind of put on the spot, made me very nervous. I was stumbling over my words a lot, but, um, Dr. Zach Bush, I was talking more about ancestral and indigenous eating. That's what I thought I was talking about. And he kept asking me questions about fermentation. So whatever. But it's a good podcast. There's some amazing doctors on that if you want to listen to it. Um, but the biggest thing to think about for non-scientists or lay people in terms of healthy gut microbiome, aside from eating fermented foods like sauerkraut, and uh, kimchi and kombucha and poor tea is variety. So the gut microbiome thrives on variety of food. Historically, we would have eaten a massive variety of food. And nowadays we eat what we get off the shelf in the grocery store, which is hugely limited. And furthermore, because food has been hybridized for shelf stability and for appearance, it is the nutrient density has diminished profoundly. So for example, there's a wonderful book called Eating on the Wild Side by Joe Testula, I think's her name. No, Joe Robinson. She talks about the carrot. So we all know about the orange carrot, which we all eat typically. The orange carrot is a hybridization of the original carrot, which is an Afghani carrot. It's a purple carrot. And then there's a mutated carrot, which is a white carrot. Those two carrots back in like the 1700s, I think it was in Denmark or something, the House of Orange presented the scientists of the time spliced together the purple and white carrot to create an orange carrot that they then presented to the House of Orange after a big battle was won. And that orange carrot became the carrot that was popular in Europe, it became trendy, whatever. And it has the nutrient density that's like a hundred times less than the purple and white carrot. And this is tr this is just one example of how all these foods over time have from their original heirloom 
uh, seeds and, and sources, you know, like the yellow, the sweet yellow onion. That's hybridized, I think, in like the East Coast or something earlier in the early 1900s. But a lot of these foods have lost a lot of the nutrient density that they had originally. And so trying to get food, you know, from a local CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, and foods that are uh, native to the environment and that ideally are from heirloom seeds will increase, increase um, your vitality profoundly because they have more nutrient density. So researching local CSAs and especially CSAs that are interested in heirloom seeds and heirloom crops um, is a really, really wonderful, simple way. And they deliver a box of food to your house every week and it'll have weird things that you wouldn't buy in the grocery store like turnips or eggplant or whatever. So it forces you to cook more diverse recipes that you might not cook um, if you're just left to go to the grocery store on your own and follow your own impulses. Because usually our impulses don't go, yes, turnips, I need to buy turnips this week. Um, <clears throat> so this book on longevity is wonderful. It's a fun read. You can also listen to Walter Longo's um, podcasts on like Rich Roll or some of the other podcasts. I've also done some extensive podcasts with Rich Roll on diet, which you might find interesting if you want. Okay, I really love this book. It's called Recipes for Self-Healing. Um, and it is a book by uh, Daverick Leggett. I like it because it's based in Chinese medicine. But the thing I like about it the most is these dishes are like really easy to make um, and they don't take a long time. Like the preparation time is usually like 15 minutes and then 20, 30 minutes to prepare the meal. And I have not made a meal out of this that has not been incredibly delicious. It also goes into the energetics of the food. Like does it support the lungs or the intestines or digestion or... Is it warming in the body or cooling in the body, etc.? So this is a really lovely book. And the introduction is fantastic, talking about the energetics of food. Now, this I recommend to people because it's accessible. If you want the very complex version of this and you really love food and diet, this book, Healing with Whole Foods by Paul Pitchford, um, is an incredible book. And it talks about Asian traditions and modern nutrition. This is like, if you want one heavy duty book in your kitchen um, on healing and on whole foods, this is the one. And it's got all sorts of tricks. Like, for example, when you're cooking beans, right? Beans, beans, the magical fruit. A lot of people don't eat a lot of beans because they don't like farting. And... Uh, you know, flatulence is a big problem for some people. There is a, there's a solution, my friends. The solution uh, is he recommends making um, your beans with four different herbs, which I don't, I didn't mark the page, unfortunately, but um, when you cook, when you prepare the beans, you add these four herbs and it breaks down the phytic acid or whatever is causing flatulence to happen such that um, it helps your body break down and digest beans and prevent that wonderful thing phenomenon from happening. So this book's just got a lot of really wonderful tips around cooking and it's an incredible wealth of knowledge, but as you can see, it's an intense book. So it also has specific conditions, you know, multiple sclerosis or um, my best friend has multiple sclerosis and it's got like 20 pages on diet for multiple sclerosis and it's helped him a lot. So if you're suffering from specific health conditions, this book has a tremendous wealth of information on that. Okay, the last diet related book that, I'll, that I'm pulling these out for spring ideas, kind of. I really like the work of Annie Jubb and David Jubb. Um, they've written a couple books. They're really super brainy, smart people. Um, Annie used to have a raw food cafe in Los Angeles that was fantastic. I don't think it's there anymore. But this food's called the Life Food Recipe Book. Um, and 
it's raw food, but if you want to eat, if you feel like you need to cleanse your body, even doing a week of raw food is really energizing, really healing. I do a cleanse out of this book. I just did it about a month ago, uh, a liver cleanse every spring. The cleanse in here is fantastic. It explains how to do enemas and colonics. Um, it explains herbs that you can use to detoxify. The recipes are really easy to make. They're absolutely delicious. The salads in here are like the best salads I've ever had. Um, a lot of soups and a lot of just really wonderful information about food. I think they've got a couple other books too, uh, the, Ju the Jubs do. But specifically for a spring cleanse, the one that's in here is fantastic. Um, it's intense. The like fifth day of the cleanse, I felt like I was on some psychotropic, I, I haven't done acid, but I imagine that's what being on acid feels like. I was like hallucinating in my house. Uh, my partner was like, what's up with you? You've been walking around with like a stupid smile on your face all day and you're not forming sentences. Anyways, it was a fantastic experience, all as a result of eating the foods in this book. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The last thing I wanna go into in the next couple minutes, because I'm carrying on here for a while and I do wanna offer the opportunity to ask some questions if you want, um, are the six healths. And so I'm actually just gonna mention these. I'm not gonna go into great depth in them. I might mention one or two things about each of them. The first and fundamental is sleep. Sleep hygiene is so essential. Um, I'm just gonna say two things about it. Um, Ariana Huffington actually wrote a wonderful book on sleep a couple years ago. There's been a ton of research on sleep and the importance of deep REM sleep, stage four REM sleep. The most important thing in sleep for me is that the state of mind you go to sleep in is essential to the health of the sleep you have. So meditating before bed is really key. Here's the other thing I want to share. There is a, there is a window. There's a tremendous work you can do in dreams if you can develop a practice of lucid dreaming. In other words, waking up during your dream state. The Taoists did a lot of work around this. I'll probably do a whole video on it soon. But the, the first and fundamental aspect of this is there is a liminal state while you're falling asleep and while you are right when you wake up where the mind, the conscious mind in the um, where the consciousness is still resting in the, in the cerebellum, in the, in the um, subliminal state before you've gone into the conscious mind and woken up and you're moving around. In terms of reprogramming your subconscious, which is your beliefs, your unconscious beliefs that are driving all your behavior, if you have an affirmation and that relates to drinking the water consciously or having an intention, so for example, uh, breaking bad habits, breaking addictions, um, setting intentions around things you're wanting to manifest in your life. If the minute you wake up in the morning and as you're falling asleep, you listen to that affirmation or intention either in earphones or you're just saying it out loud or saying it quietly, you, it starts to bleed into the subconscious or to influence the subconscious. That reprogramming of the unconscious mind, as far as my experience has been, has been the only way to break bad habits, break addictions, and also create um, new reprogramming beliefs. So if you have beliefs around scarcity or around self-worth or around confidence or around um, your ability to learn something or to do something. Um, for me, the greatest secret to that is in these windows before and after you fall asleep, when you fall asleep and you wake up. Also, by getting into that deeper state and peaceful, harmonious state as you're falling asleep, you'll go to deeper stages of sleep and that will start to affect your dream state. More on that in another video. Sleep is the first health. The second health is diet. We've talked a lot about that in this video already. The third is movement. Um, the one thing I wanna say about movement is that 
traditional Western exercise of like this kind of thing or this kind of thing, like th the work in gyms is reverse engineering. You're trying to reverse engineer your body to look a certain way. It does not lend itself to joint mobility, to suppleness of, of cartilage, ligaments, tendons, myofascia, and joint stability, as well as the health of the spine. So, you know, there are practices like Qigong, Tai Chi, martial arts, but there are also compound and composite exercises. You might consider, consider the work of Ido Portal, who is, watch a video of that guy, it's mind-blowing what he can do with his body. Um, Timothy Sheaf, and something I've been really into in the last year is rope work. You can look on Instagram at The Way of the Rope. Rope work is incredible uh, movement work based on elliptical movement. All you need is a rope. So it happens to be my dog's leash. I run with them into the woods and then I do rope work which opens the whole body up for Tai Chi or Qigong or martial arts. Uh, rope work is also a lot of fun and it's not really difficult to learn. So if you do just do traditional weight-based exercises, I recommend trying to break that up with like yoga or more compound, composite, complex movement. Um, okay, mindfulness practice. For me, that's T. Any kind of ritual practice or mindfulness practice is going to help cultivate mindfulness that affects then the rest of your life and allows you to be more present, more alive, and more attentive to all the different aspects of your life. Um, that's the three bowl practice for me in the morning. So we have sleep, diet, movement, mindfulness practice, and then meditation. Again, we host meditations every Thursday. If you don't already have a meditation practice, consider coming to one of them because um, we're teaching out of the Taoist and Zen Buddhist tradition. Um, and then the sixth of the sixth helps is sobriety or treating addiction. Not everybody needs sobriety because they can have a very healthy relationship and enjoy a glass of wine. Rich in resveratrol helps your longevity and calms the heart, good for heart health. But a lot of people struggle with different addictions, which might be sugar, or it might be pornography, or it might be um, you know, tobacco, or alcohol, or weed, or drugs, or whatever. Most people have some kind of addiction. And so if a person has an addict tendency, then maybe real full sobriety is helpful. And in order to do that, we have to start to affect the unconscious or subconscious mind. Um, if one doesn't have an addictive personality, then it's really about moderation and having a really healthy relationship to substances. Um, again, too much alcohol uh, profoundly affects the liver and affects our ability to vision. Marijuana affects the liver in that it freezes the chi of the liver so the irony of marijuana is that it opens up your creativity, which it does. It opens the heart, it opens up the emotional body, and it can open up your creativity. But you may have noticed people who smoke marijuana regularly, frequently, they often have great ideas, but they cannot then use that liver energy to bring their vision into reality. They have great ideas, but they can't actually execute on bringing their ideas into reality. That is the most common pattern of people who smoke too much marijuana. So <clears throat> again, coming back to those six healths and checking in, okay, do I have these dialed in? If you have those dialed in, your foundation for health and vitality is gonna be pretty strong. Again, sleep, diet. Diet also includes herbs. Um, sleep, diet, movement, mindfulness practice, which is tea for me, meditation, and healthy relationship to substances. So that's sobriety or your relationship to ad addictive substances. So those are the six foundational practices and the six other aspects of vitality. I'm gonna mention them briefly and maybe in another video I'll go into depth about them. The first one is healing work. So obviously I come out of a background in traditional Chinese medicine that includes acupuncture, herbalism, moxibustion, uh, which is burning mugwort, cupping, um, 
and body work, twena, which is uh, physical body work. I obviously think traditional Chinese medicine is incredible for, for healing, um, but even just doing body work once or twice a month, so important. And we tend to neglect our own well being and not get body work or healing work because we think we can't afford it or we don't have time. But the reality is that in the long term, if you don't do that maintenance, you'll suffer in other ways and it'll catch up with you later on. So I think finding a Chinese um, practitioner of Chinese medicine or an integrative or functional medicine doctor uh, is really important. And especially one that you trust and that you really, you really believe that they're good practitioners. You know, this is true of Western doctors as well. They're incredible practitioners of Chinese medicine, mediocre, eh, not so good. But the wonderful thing about Chinese medicine that you don't have as much say with Ayurvedic or with nutritionists is we have to go through rigorous training. I was in school for almost seven years full time and we have to pass all of the national medical boards, which are like a nightmare. But um, it requires that your baseline of knowledge is really there's a strong foundation. Um, so healing work is the seventh vitality. Okay, here's a secret tip if you have a partner. Um, there is a, a, a massage tool called TheraBody, which is an incredible tool, but it costs like 300 bucks. And you can buy a Black & Decker car polisher. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, that costs $32. And if you go to a website called Wirecutter, Wirecutter has reviews of all these things. And you type in massage tools, it costs $32. It is an amazing massage tool. If you have a partner and they're like, I don't want a massage, it's, I'm tired, it's too much work. All you need is a car polisher, it costs 30 bucks. Boom, good to go. Okay, moving on. Um, Intimacy and sexuality. So this is obviously a huge topic. I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but one thing I wanna say is a healthy relationship to intimacy is so important. Intimacy really is about vulnerability and it's about being present with somebody. And us, we have to be vulnerable in our relationships to have healthy relationships. One thing I wanna recommend, um, is that for men, um, this concept of uh, seminal or seminal retention is a very Taoist idea. Um, this book, which is called Taoist Secrets of Love, Cultivating Male Sexual Energy by Montak Chia, is a very profound book. Um, Montak Chia's books on cultivating sexual energy for health and vitality are wonderful books. Um, that practice, a lot of the reason that I think men, once they get into their 40s and their 50s and 60s, their health declines, their fundamental energy declines, their libido declines, their capacity for very strong vital energy declines is because of ejaculation over the course of a lifetime. The basis of seminal retention or seminal retention is cultivating certain practices to um, have internal um, orgasms instead of uh, external ejaculation. So I'm, I'm not gonna go into this too much because it's a big topic, but my recommendation and suggestion is looking into it. And Montak Chia also has books for women to cultivate their vital chi, their vital energy, um, and to relate to sexuality, not just as a pleasure, but rather as an opportunity to cultivate energy, cultivate vulnerability. If you relate to sexuality as a cultivation practice or as a spiritual practice, it can bring much deeper levels of intimacy into one's relationship with their partner. Um, I'm gonna kind of leave that topic at that for now. Again, it's opening a big can of worms. So um, the next is stress management. What I'm gonna say about stress management is that if you're doing all these other general practices, you're attending to your health in other ways, then your stress levels should diminish significantly because your health is vital. Oftentimes, so stress, the actual um, clinical definition of stress 
is the perception that you have more to do than you are capable of. So stress, the source of stress is actually at the level of perception. It's too much. I can't do this much. Um, which largely is a result of how much energy do I have and how many things do I have to accomplish? So it's largely a matter of the, at the level of the mind. If you have an abundance of energy and um, your life is balanced otherwise and you're tending to your stress in other ways or to your well-being in other ways, your ability to cope with stress goes way up. The other thing I'll say about stress the introduction of adaptogenic herbs can, which upregulate or downregulate the endocrine system. Adaptogenic herbs can help stress profoundly. So um, I developed a formula. It's called the Living Tea. It's on Living Tea's website. It's called the Immunity and Longevity Blend. It is four herbs. They're adaptogenic herbs. They're specifically to address stress, support longevity, and boost immunity. Um, I tried to source really good, really clean organic herbs, and it's pretty darn inexpensive. I take a tablespoon of that every morning, and I don't get—I haven't gotten sick in years, literally. So um, that's a consideration. Relationships again. This gets an in intimacy and sexuality. Having healthy relationships. I'm only going to say two things about them. One, we have a tendency, an avoidant culture. We avoid difficult conversations. We avoid discomfort and as a result that habit and tendency makes for pathological and dysfunctional relationships the health of a health the health of a good relationship the vitality of a good relationship is our capacity to be present with each other in discomfort and leaning into that discomfort that's also what lends itself to intimacy so there is a profound tool called NVC or nonviolent communication. Um, I work with a practitioner out of Los Angeles, a dear friend of mine, who I'm happy to make recommendations. Email me if you want his name. Nonviolent communication. There's also a woman, uh, Jade, my partner, is taking a course with a woman in nonviolent communication. The basic essence of it is being able to listen on a deeper level. So when there's problems in a relationship, it's understanding the person's needs and their wants and being able to tend to them or not tend to them. So in relationships, it has to do with communication. This is why the three bowls practice in the morning with a partner is so profound. And a person saying how they feel and listening and repeating back to them. Okay, so what I'm understanding you say is blah, blah, blah. And they can say, no, you didn't, you weren't listening. When you do this exercise, you realize we don't listen very well because we're always thinking about our own thoughts or what we're gonna say or how we've had that experience. We usually don't really just shut up and listen. And so nonviolent communication is learning to listen deeply. Thich Nhat Hanh has beautiful teachings on this about deep listening, really listening from the heart and listening with the body, not listening with the mind. And then telling the person, here's what I'm hearing you say that person then feels heard and they, they feel seen. When we cultivate that type of communication, it lends itself to profound levels of intimacy, hearing each other, seeing each other, feeling like your heart is open to the person. And we all wanna be seen, we all wanna matter. It's so essential to a healthy relationship to listen. I think it's the root of a healthy relationship and the root of intimacy. So. That's all I'm gonna say about relationships at the moment. The other one is we can't live with a clear heart if we have unresolved shit with people. So if it's your uncle or your dad or your brother or your friend and you don't go through the difficulty of healing that relationship, there's always part of your heart that is not clear. So trying to, this is part of live as if you're gonna to die tomorrow. Have those conversations. Our life is too short. Don't. If you have unresolved stuff in relationships, have those conversations, heal those relationships, because the truth is we don't know. We don't know when other people are gonna die. We don't know when we're gonna die. So getting clear in those relationships is so necessary to feel free in our lives. Okay, the next thing is wealth. We're on our last two here. Thank you for bearing with me. 
The last two is wealth. Um, I just want to say one thing about this. Some of you might be financially really healthy and strong and you understand your finances and you have a great relationship to money and you don't have scarcity mentality or poverty vows and you just have a great relationship to money and that you're stable in that relationship. Some of you might not. <clears throat> we all have different relationships to it. Working with the level of beliefs so our relationship to wealth is oftentimes our relationship to a sense of self-worth. If we don't believe we are worthy of having financial stability and health in our lives, then we won't. If we believe that, then we are going to manifest a reality where we are struggling financially. So believing in your self-worth, cultivating a sense of confidence, believing in your gifts, sharing them with the world, that is at the essence of having a healthy relationship to, to deserving financial stability. That's at the level of the psychology and the emotions of wealth. Now, at the practical level, I don't think anybody can save money, and I'm speaking from my own experience, without a budget. <laughs> so there is an app, people use Mint, but I really like, there's an app called YNAB, Y-N-A-B.com. It stands for You Need a Budget. That tool has totally transformed my relationship to money, to the way I budget money throughout the course of a month, and specifically my ability and capacity to save money. So that in the long term, I have goals that I'm working towards. My partner and I are, we would like to build a house at some point where we are. That will never happen if I didn't budget money the way that I do. If you haven't looked into YNAB, it takes a little bit of time to set up. But once it's set up, it's really easy to manage. And it totally revolutionized my, my relationship to money. Why that was so profound for me is that I realized I had a chronic low level degree of anxiety all the time because my finances were like an insane roller coaster. And now that I really understand money and, how, and not spending more than I make, I have command over it and I don't have anxiety about money anymore. I know how much I need to make every month. I know how much I need to save, etc. And I have goals and it just reorganized my life. So I really recommend uh, that app. It is absolutely worth the time. And then the very last thing is purpose. And so purpose is essential to a fulfilled human life, a sense of direction, a sense of goals, waking up with a sense of meaning, with a sense of what am I doing with my precious life energy? Um, having a sense of purpose is so important. And if the other aspects of, of health, like the, the first six healths are in place and you don't know what your purpose is, as you meditate, as you connect more deeply with your inner voice and your conscience, you will come closer and closer and closer to a natural tendency we say tea is a shen tonic. As the shen inhabits us because we're more balanced, the eyes open. So we say the shen opens the eyes and we start to see, oh, this is my path. This is what I'm meant to do with my life. If you don't have a strong sense of purpose, start at the level of your sleep, your diet, your movement, your meditation, etc., and start to see if your sense of purpose becomes more and more clear over time. So again, sleep, diet, movement, Mindfulness practice, meditation, sobriety or addiction, healing work, intimacy and sexuality, stress management, relationships, wealth, and purpose. So those for me are 12 pillars. And if you have all those things dialed in, your life will, will go in a very good direction. And maybe it's already fantastic, that's wonderful, but it's worth checking in with all those things and how you relate to all those things because if you need to do some work on some of them, then that can bring in a more balanced uh, life and bring greater vitality and greater health and greater wellness so that you can really show up and uh, fulfill your purpose in, in your life. Uh, ultimately, it's about greater happiness, greater t contentedness, and uh, living, living your dharma, living your ming, living your purpose. So thank you for that absurd hour and 45 minute rant. I hope there was some good information there and some value. 
and that you received something in there that helped unlock maybe an area in your life that you could work on or, um, or bring some, some of these different ideas in uh, to your life. So thank you so much for bearing with me. And if anybody has any questions or they want to share anything, then uh, please unmute and this would be a good time. I have a question about one of the books, um, Colin. I forget which one. Give me a second. No problem. Um, Recipes for by Leggett. How do you spell Leggett? Um, L-E-G-G-E-T-T. -T. Uh, Leggett. And... Okay. Again, that's a wonderful book for its simplicity and also the recipes are delicious. And also it talks a lot about healing through food, you know, which Hippo Hippocrates, the father of, or the, what do we say? The, yeah, the father of modern medicine says, let food be thy medicine. And that book is really wonderful because you can learn about food as medicine. Okay, and what was the title? Recipes for... Uh, recipes for Self-Healing. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, Colin, I have a question about okay. tea. In terms of caffeine, I'm super sensitive. And I just can't drink it later in the day. Mm -hmm. So any suggestions for me? Yeah, sure. So we did, there is a short blog on the website on caffeine and tea. Okay. Um, but more specifically, some teas are going to be far more caffeinated than other teas. Mm -hmm. um, if you're really caffeine sensitive, then I would maybe stay away from red tea. Um, and I would tend more towards Shopur as well as aged Shungpur. Those are gonna be the most calming teas. And also uh, Yencha, which is a type of oolong tea. Um, those are gonna be really gentle and mild on, um, you know, adrenaline and cortisol levels and general um, stimulation. They're lower in caffeine. Um, so that's my, my general recommendation. Also, you know, we have a lot of herbal teas that we carry and, um, and also medicinal mushrooms. So you might like, you know, a medicinal mushroom blend or like I said, that immunity longevity blend mm -hmm. of herbs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those are really nice in the evening. So you put boiling water with them and then especially with the medicinal mushrooms like reishi, um, you would add, I sometimes add like some almond milk and a little honey and like make a, a mushroom latte in the evening. Reishi in particular is wonderful for sleep. So um, it helps facilitate deeper sleep and also um, immune health and emotional health and well-being. I notice when I drink a, a reishi drink at night before bed, I often wake up feeling really happy and um, in a, in a great space. So them, them is my suggestions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it looks like, uh, that's it for inquiries. So again, thank you. Thank you everybody for coming and spending some time on a Saturday night with me and with each other. Uh, we appreciate it so much and, um, you know, let us know if there's anything you want to learn about. Um, you know, we're teaching a class every Saturday and one thing I want to mention is that we've got a new community section on the Living Tea website and it's got ambassadors who are people sharing tea and their profiles and also all these previous classes and meditations we put up every week. Um, and the last thing that's, I think, really exciting is there's an event calendar. And so we have other teachers who are going to be sharing classes 
and workshops and tea ceremonies. And the whole idea is just to create more community and to share. Um, we haven't loaded it with the events. I'll be doing that over the next two days or so. Um, but check that out on like Tuesday or Wednesday this coming week because you'll start to see classes being populated there, you know, on all sorts of things that are tea related. Um, so I hope that that's a wonderful resource for folks going forward and it fulfills our an essential mission of ours, which is to help uh, support people and, and build community and also to educate. So, um, so I think that's, that's all I got for y'all. Have a wonderful Saturday evening and uh, we'll see you all very soon. Thank you.